Welcome to another edition of Daily Airline News focusing on the tragic loss of Air India Flight 171. I'm Geoffrey Thomas and I'm delighted to say, joined by my co-host Richard Godfrey in Frankfurt, Germany. I'm not sure whether it's still morning there. I think it might be afternoon, Richard. It's uh, now afternoon, yeah. yeah. And it's probably good evening to you, I think. It is, it is good evening to me. Now, viewers, we did say tonight that we were going to, or today we are going to talk to you about MH370. Well, we are indeed, but a little bit later. There's going to be two episodes tonight. The first one, which is what we're going to do now, is Air India Culture and Operations. So in response to many viewer questions, we're examining the culture and operational record of Air India and its subsidiaries. And it's not a good story. In fact, it's a troubling one. Sir Rod Eddington, former chief of Cathay Pacific, ANSET and British Airways, once told me that changing airline culture was like trying to do an engine change in flight. Impossible. Taking a different perspective, Sarah Nelson from the Association of Flight Attendants says, you've got pilots, cabin crew, ground staff, tech teams, unions and management all operating on different timelines, incentives and realities. Aligning that takes more than a memo. Meanwhile, my colleague Peter Harbison, founder of the Centre for Aviation, put it this way, legacy carriers often confuse tradition with culture, but tradition doesn't inspire, it just persists. For decades, Air India was more than just a national carrier. It was a symbol of India's post-independence ambition. With its red and white livery and its iconic Maharaja mascot, the airline once embodied world-class service and prestige. But behind that glamorous exterior lay a corrosive internal culture that gradually pushed Air India into operational dysfunction, customer dissatisfaction and financial ruin. Today, as the Tata Group attempts to revive the airline it originally founded in the 1930s, the battle is not only upgrade, about upgrading aircraft or booking systems, it's about rewiring a deeply entrenched institutional mindset. Richard, this is a very challenging story and not a good one. Yes, you're right, Geoffrey. Uh, so where did the trouble begin? Well, Richard, when Air India was nationalised in 1953, it transitioned from a privately run airline by the Tata Group to a public sector undertaking called a PSU. Over time, it absorbed the culture that plagued many Indian state-owned enterprises, a focus on hierarchy, risk aversion, and bureaucratic red tape. Decision-making became slow, influenced more by political pressure than market logic. Procurement was often opaque. Unions wielded significant power. Promotions were based on seniority, not skill. This cultural shift from private excellence into public sec sector mediocrity took decades to materialise, but its effects were systemic. So was the PSU model to blame for the malaise? Well, one of Air India's most persistent problems, persistent problems was a sense of entitlement across ranks where employees were used to job security a state backing regardless of performance. This led to a, a series of problems, low accountability, complaints against rude staff or mishandled baggage often went unaddressed, resistance to discipline, efforts to introduce biometric attendance or enforced stricter reporting protocols were met with protests, inflated perks and benefits, Senior staff and pilots often enjoyed free upgrades, travel allowances and privileges out of step with the airline's financial reality. This culture fostered a government job mindset in a global industry that thrives on customer service and operational excellence. Union dominance and resistance to change was a big issue and the airline's unions played a vital role in protecting employee interests but also became a formidable barrier to reform. So how did this mindset manifest itself? 
Well, Richard, the pilot unions were opposed to fleet restructuring, fearing loss of seniority or base transfers. Ground staff unions blocked outsourcing of services, even when the quality improvements and cost savings were clear. Cabin crew resisted new grooming standards, citing infringement of personal freedom. And in 2011, the merger with Indian Airlines, meant to streamline operations, was internally sabotaged by unions, politics, um, and staff from both entities refused to integrate fully, leading to fragmented rosters, duplicated functions, and uh, us-them mentality. It was just, it was just chaotic. That sounds a uh, pretty uh, messy situation. Mm. So how did the leadership uh, handle this situation? Well, Richard, this is one of the biggest issues. There's been a leadership vacuum, a revolving door with frequent turnover. Air India had over a dozen managing directors and chairpersons in three decades. Most of them were just career bureaucrats from the Indian Administrative Services, the IAS. This manifested itself in a series of problems. Short-termism, each new leader launched fresh initiatives with little continuity. Low morale, employees rarely saw change follow through. Lack of aviation expertise, the top executives often lacked airline experience, leaving key technical decisions to mid-level managers or consultants. And in this vacuum, middle management grew bloated and risk-averse, so Air India ended up with nearly three times the workforce required to run the airline. <laughs> Sounds like a disaster, um, especially when you consider the aviation industry is based on continuity and long-term decision-making is vital. Look, indeed, and this is where the problems really began to show. While, in, while Air India had a large and technically qualified workforce, many lacked up-to-date skills or motivation. Cabin crew often received outdated soft skills training. Ground handlers were slow to adapt to new baggage scanning or tracking systems. Engineers struggled with mixed aircraft types and poor documentation. Now, internal audits repeatedly flagged failure to, to adhere to standard operating procedures, SOPs outdated simulator training, improper rostering, sometimes violating duty time limitations. So instead of addressing root causes, the airline often looked outward, blaming weather, airport congestion or supplier delays. This only entrenched a culture of deflection over introspection. So the, the key question is, how did the customers respond to this dismal record? Well, dismally is a word. That's about it. On TripAdvisor, which is the number one ranking organisation when it comes to passenger feedback, Air India has nearly 11,000 reviews and a score of 2.5 out of 5. A staggering 3,960 respondents rated it as terrible. Another 1,190 said poor. 1,692 gave it average and only 4,000 reviews read the airline was either good or excellent. So what about external audits? What did they find? Well, Richard, this is where it gets a lot worse, much worse. Instead of reading out all the details, we've summarised the key audit findings on our website, 42,000 feet, that's 42kft.com, and there's a link below in the description. Uh, to a story which gives you the full details. But here's a brief summary. Uh, the merger of Air India and Indian Airlines was ill-timed and undertaken without adequate justification. It failed to achieve synergy and led to sharp decline in operational performance. Another one was despite infusing equity of 3 billion US under the turnaround plan, Air India could not achieve break-even operations, largely due to poor cost control, inefficient route planning and failure to rationalise staff deployment. Another was multiple aircraft were found to have inoperative in-flight in entertainment systems, worn-out seats, malfunctioning lavatory locks and stained cabin panels. Some of these issues have been reported multiple times without rectification. 
Another was cabin upkeep is not in line with the airline's stated standards. Deferred interior maintenance items were observed on more than 60% of the aircraft sampled. And customer service perception is severely impacted by inconsistent cabin product, delayed grievance red redressal and staff attitude. Issues that require urgent cultural overhaul in addition to technical fixes. Now, I should mention these quotations are from Indian government audits. They're not some consultant or anything like that. These are all Indian government audits. And as I said, the story with all the details of who said what is in that story, which I urge you to have a look at. Mm, it sounds uh, like a damning uh, set of reports. Mm. So how did that play out on the performance numbers? Uh, did the performance numbers mirror these audits? Uh, well, pretty much. In 2018, Air India had one of the worst on-time performance OTP records among global carriers, dipping below 60% in several areas. Uh, while that has improved to around 80% today, it, it was a significant red flag of its problems. And in 2017, Air India had over 14,000 employees for a fleet of fewer than 120 aircraft, three times the staffing ratio of global best-in-class cl carriers. Wow. Um, so, Jeff, hasn't the government been trying to offload Air India for decades? Yes, look, they have, Richard, and the efforts began in the early 2000s and gained traction in post-2017, but there were few takers willing to inherit $8 billion in debt, thousands of entrenched employees, opaque procurement and HR systems, legacy contracts with unions and vendors. Uh, and it's interesting, I've been following Air India saga all the way through, and they're always saying, oh, Lufthansa wants to buy us, and British Airways wants to buy us, and this airline wants to buy us, and we just shake our heads and say, no chance. So eventually, uh, the Tata Group finally acquired Air India back in 2022. Uh, it inherited not just aircraft, but decades of culture in inertia. Hmm. <laughs> it's got a huge task on their hands, yeah, haven't they? They have. And so, what about accidents and uh, incidents? Uh, what's the track record of Air India uh, on that side? Well, it's not good either, Richard. According to data from Aero Inside, since 12, 2012, Air India and Air India Express have experienced 185 incidents. incidents of which 12 involved Air India Express. Not all were fatal, but many were serious. Air India's last fatal passenger crash, excluding terrorism, was in 1982, while Air India Express has had two fatal crashes, one in 2010 and the other one was in 2020, both involving pilot error and runway excursions where the aircraft went off the end of the runway and uh, down a cliff. The incident breakdown is as follows. Uh, they've had engine issues, 28 of those, 21 bird strikes. Now, that's not an Air India problem. I absolutely agree with that. Hydraulic failures, 14. Smoke events, 10. Tire issues, 10. Runway excursions, 8. Cabin pressure issues, 6. Landing accidents, 4. And other another 84 incidents of one kind or, or another. Now, today, Air India and Air India Express operate a combined fleet of 137 Airbus and 114 Boeing aircraft. The incident rates are fairly evenly split, with 91 involving Airbus and 94 involving Boeing. However, it should be noted that in addition, the airline group has 15 Airbus and 19 Boeings parked. Um, according to uh, Planespotters.net, uh, that's not a glowing safety record, uh, Jeffrey. Mm. So, what is uh, the Tata Group going to do about all this? Well, Richard, they're pulling every lever available to steer the airline on a new course, and you know, they're, and they're to be commended for what they're doing. The initiatives include appointing leaders with private sector aviation backgrounds 
introducing KPIs and performance-linked bonuses, rolling out voluntary retirement schemes to reduce overstaffing, merging Air India, Vistara and Air, Air Asia India under one AIX Connect brand, and they've ordered 470 new aircraft from Boeing and Airbus in 2022 and modernising 67 older aircraft from 2024. In other words, new interiors and total new face look. But here's the bottom line. The airline can't be modern if its systems aren't. And a system can't evolve if its people won't. The Tata Group has the capital, the brand and the long-term vision. But to make Air India a world-class airline again, they must win not just the market, but the hearts, the habits, and the minds of the people within the organisation. Well, they seem to go back a long way into history, and they've got a big job on their hands. And mm. we can only hope that the Tata Group will turn it around and uh, sooner rather than later. Well, they have a five-year plan, uh, Richard, but... Uh, my sense is it might be more like 10 years before they can say we're back to the glory, glory days of Air India. I mean, I travelled on Air India a number of times in the 1960s and that was a crackerjack operation and fabulous in-flight service and that was an airline you really went to. Um, not today so much. So, mm. yes. Hopefully they will turn it around um, and uh, get themselves uh, well and truly back on track. So, viewers, that's our wrap-up of Air India uh, and its culture and its operational history. Uh, that's responding to numerous questions from you, uh, asking us to have a look at it and uh, give you details. Well, we hope we've hit the mark. Um, and we do, you know, really believe that Tata will turn the airline around, um, but they've certainly got some challenges in front of them trying to uh, trying to meet their goals. So, Richard, uh, we're going to be back a little bit later with some news on MH370. Um, so, viewers, uh, thank you for, for subscribing to us. Thank you for liking us. Please keep those comments coming. They're, uh, they're really fantastic. And uh, please tune in tomorrow when we'll be looking at questions that you may have on, uh, M on uh, Air India uh, 171 and also the airline's culture and operations. Thank you.